Happy Monday, Building Science Geeks. It's me, Mariana Pickering, co-founder of EMU, here for another one of our Monday BS Building Science sessions. This week is especially hectic. I'm getting this video done just under the wire. Um, we just kicked off day one today of our Fort Collins, um, Colorado Passive House Builder Boot Camp. So everybody's downstairs right now in our training room with Enrico teaching them um, units one through five today. And tomorrow they'll do units six through 10. And then Wednesday and Thursday, they will do the hands-on workshop part. And then on Friday, we're gonna have a, an exam for a whole bunch of new uh, certified PassFast tradespeople. So one of the things that came up this morning already in class um, that I thought would be an interesting topic for today's Monday BS is the subject of thermal mass. Um, we used to have a unit that it was just on thermal insulation, but the topic of thermal mass came up so frequently that we decided we needed to address it. Um, much of this will be some myth busting about the effect of thermal mass, and hopefully you'll find it interesting. Thermal mass comes up a lot, especially in sustainable building circles. Um, I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding about the significance or the impact of thermal mass. One thing we need to be clear about, first of all, is the difference between thermal insulation and thermal mass. As I mentioned, the training for our passive house builders is going on right now downstairs. And I thought I would bring our textbook up and show you a really good analogy for the way that Enrico, our main trainer, our, our lead trainer, the way that he describes thermal insulation versus thermal mass. So one analogy that we use in training to explain thermal insulation versus thermal mass is the speed limit versus the car park. Speed limit is the thermal insulation where we are trying to slow down heat moving through an assembly from a warmer to a colder body. And the car park is more like thermal mass where we're storing up on something so that over long periods of time that can then be released. So next I'm gonna play a little clip from class for you of Enrico explaining the fundamental question, do we need thermal mass? Um, at the beginning he mentions uh, the difference between passive house and passive solar, which is worth repeating real quick before we jump into that clip. Um, for those of you who don't know the difference between passive house and passive solar, here's a quick rundown. The passive solar movement was a design movement back in the 80s um, that led to a lot of really good architectural design considerations like orientation and um, using passive solar gains. However, it wasn't tied with any specific performance metrics. Passive house is different because it's actually a standard that's been codified over 30 years of research um, to create a performance metric, much like a building code um, that has to be met through modeling. The reason we use passive house as our internal benchmark is because it gives us the parameters, the actual numbers that we're trying to hit. Whereas the passive solar movement, while there were a lot of good things that came out of that design movement, um, it can be a little bit slippery. Uh, you can often find passive solar homes in Colorado that do overheat in the summer because they were so focused on gaining heat through large windows um, in the winter. So it needs to be modeled for all seasons, for all climates, especially now with global warming as a consideration for our future. So let's just pop into class for just one minute and listen to Enrico's advice on thermal mass considerations. Now, do we need thermal mass? Again, difference between passive house and passive solar. Passive house is based on 30 years of monitoring and much more sophisticated model. The difference is that uh, in, it depends on the type of building. In residential building, the impact provided by thermal mass is negligible compared to, say, better windows or good air tightness, or uh, good ventilation. So if you're a residential builder or designer, this is going to have minimal impact on single family home design. Um, if you're looking at where your money should be best spent in order to meet high performance criteria, I would definitely put money towards insulation, good windows, and air sealing and mechanical ventilation far before that of thermal mass. 
And in high occupancy buildings, so think of something like a school, those internal gains can vary pretty wildly throughout the day, depending on how many people are in the space, um, how they're using that space. So in that case, thermal mass can contribute to heat storage capacity. It basically soaks it up like a sponge and then releases it slowly over time. This can help optimize those larger mechanical systems that you would find in those buildings. The key takeaway here, though, is just that in residential design and in, in trying to meet high performance for single family homes, um, it's best not to spend too much energy on the thermal mass concept or conversation. Uh, it's much better to redirect your attention towards high performance windows and doors, uh, mechanical ventilation with continuous fresh air exchange and air sealing. All right, that's all I've got for you this week. Just a little tidbit on thermal mass versus thermal insulation. If you'd like to learn more, remember to follow us on Instagram and Facebook or Meta now, I guess. Um, we're at, at EMU BLDG, Building Science. Um, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel here and suggest any other topics you want us to cover over the next few weeks. Last but not least, if you're interested in joining any of our training, please let me know either in the comments or you can email training at emubuildingscience.com. Um, we run quarterly in-person training here in Colorado. We're also on the road a lot. We're going to be in San Jose, California at the end of March, uh, likely in Boston in June, and hopefully in the Midwest in the fall. If you're unwilling or unable to travel or attend an in-person training, though, we do have our entire core curriculum online in an on-demand format, and we do weekly live Q&A sessions with the trainer. Um, our spring crew uh, is open right now for registration and will close on March 18th, I believe. Um, but we do that every quarter as well. So please reach out and let me know if you need any help signing up for training. Thank you.